How about a little field trip today? Hey there, it's Teddy coming to you from down in my record room with yet another vinyl orgy. And invited to this orgy is a new reissue and a variety of shelf pulls along with, yep, we're going to get out of the record room for a couple minutes on a field trip. So stick around for that a little later. But for now, let's get to it. Well, first up is a new reissue from the Contemporary Jazz Quintet. The album is called Location. Uh, it was originally released in 1973 on the Strata label. Uh, not to be confused with Strata East, completely different label. Strata Records was a small independent Detroit uh, label that put out oh, approximately 10 releases, something along those lines. Uh, but this reissue uh, is a combined effort of uh, Strata and 180 Proof. And it is a gatefold uh, that includes uh, archival photos and posters. It has a very nice matte finish. It's a cool, uh, it's a cool package for sure. Uh, but this album was born out of that very, very impressive musical and cultural heritage of Detroit, Michigan. And in Detroit, in the late 1960s and early 70s, there was a similar self-determination movement uh, like that of the AACM in Chicago or BAG in St. Louis. And Strata Records uh, was an outcropping of that movement. And the contemporary jazz quintet was integral to that effort. Um, CJQ, as they're also known, as is comprised of uh, great pianist and composer Kenny Cox, along with uh, Leon Henderson on saxophone, who happens to be uh, Joe Henderson's brother. Um, very underrated trumpet player Charles Moore, along with bassist Ron Brooks and drummer Danny Spencer. Uh, previously, uh, CJQ had had, oh, shall we say, a uh, less than ideal relationship with Blue Note Records and two releases they did for that label. Um, so Location is their first effort, uh, their first post-Blue Note effort. Um, and uh, Quintet is a little bit of a misnomer as... Uh, the group swells to uh, nine pieces for much of this album. Location is... Um, it, it's loose and intense at the same time, if that, <laughs> if that makes sense. Um, generally, there's a, a dark uh, atmospherics at play, and they're, they're working uh, in territory uh, initially staked out by Miles Davis, uh, with his wonderful trio of records, uh, Feed to Kilimanjaro, uh, In a Silent Way, and Bitches Brew. I would say, uh, you know, this isn't the uh, highest fidelity recording, as uh, there was a little bit of a DIY effort at the time uh, getting this uh, label uh, up and running. However, the, uh, the spirit and intent of this group uh, comes through loud and crystal clear. Uh, so let me step back so you can uh, check out a little bit of location uh, from the Contemporary Jazz Quintet. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I would say that if you dig that that moody early electric jazz uh, aural space, uh, then I would recommend uh, checking out Location from the Contemporary Jazz Quintet. 
Uh, originally released in 1973 on Strata Records and reissued this year, 2018, uh, from a combined effort of Strata and 180 Proof. Well, if you're looking for a live recording that truly transcends the grooves, uh, it sets up shop in your listening space and uh, fully demands your attention, then I offer Aretha live at Fillmore West. It's a 1971 Atlantic release, uh, gatefold. It's got this really cool uh, fisheye lens photograph from the back of the stage looking out towards the audience, and also the mind-blowing group, and I mean mind-blowing group, that was assembled for this concert. I mean, uh, you know, beyond Aretha Franklin and her death-defying vocals, uh, she plays some electric piano, but the group is led by the great uh, sax player King Curtis, and he assembled just a stunner here. You've got Billy Preston on organ, you've got Bernard Purdy on guitar, uh, Jerry Jamat on bass, um, who uh, Jerry Jamat, is, as James Jamerson was to bass to Motown, Jerry Jamat is to Atlantic Records and all of the incredible uh, soul recordings that he participated in. How about Bernard Purdy on drums, uh, Pancho Morales on congas. You have the Memphis Horns present, uh, lending their talent and weight uh, to the proceedings. And you've got the ever-present Sweethearts of Soul, a uh, trio of great backup singers that uh, Aretha Franklin uh, had with her on many a concert. If that is not enough, there's a cameo appearance from Ray Charles that just amps everything up even further. And as I said, the group is just mind-blowing. It's tight, it's professional, and right out of the gate... They're just firing on all cylinders as they do this amazing up-tempo version of Respect. And I'm telling you, if you're not won over by the time that song is over, well, then uh, you know your soul just might be in need of a tune-up. <laughs> I mean, it's something else. You know, from my perspective, many of the, uh, the great uh, soul records are live recordings. Um, artists like James Brown, uh, Otis Redding, uh, Sam Cooke, for example, they just uh, dip back into their uh, experience of uh, the, the intensity and the showmanship of the gospel church. And they just have that bag of tricks, that experience available, and they just know how to uh, push emotional buttons and, and bring an audience along the ebb and flow of uh, inside of a song or a concert. It's just so impressive. What's also impressive uh, here, uh, this album is, is a combination of Aretha Franklin originals and then cover tunes, uh, popular tunes of the day. And uh, the, <laughs> the cover tunes, it's as if uh, the original writers don't exist because she just owns it. And I mean owns it. <laughs> I mean, she's all over it. It's just wrapped in Aretha and, and her vibe and style. So let me just step back for a second so you can hear uh, her take on Stephen Still's Love the One You're With. Man, I tell you, Aretha Franklin clearly intended to take no prisoners on that night in San Francisco. But thankfully, the performance itself 
is what was captured. Aretha, live at Fillmore West from 1971 on Atlantic Records. Well, up next is one of the more aptly named titles uh, you'll ever run into. Uh, it's called Contrasts, and it's from Sam Rivers. It's a 1980 ECM release. And uh, yeah, there are uh, a lot of contrasts going on. It's just such a clear demonstration of the great Sam Rivers' uh, multi instrumental chops along with uh, his compositional variety. Uh, he is aided here by one of his uh, great co-conspirators over the years, uh, Dave Holland on bass, uh, along with the AACMers, uh, George Lewis on trombone, and Thurman Barker on drums and marimba. And of course, you've got Sam Rivers on soprano sax, tenor sax, and flute. Uh, this is quite an un-ECM release as it's really more New York-centric. Uh, it's on the heels of uh, the great uh, uh, loft scene, jazz loft scene in New York in the 70s, which Sam Rivers was such a uh, dynamic participant in that scene. Uh, and musically, it contrasts all over the place. <laughs> it's, it's wonderful. Uh, I mean, at times it's, it's angular, um, it's fierce, uh, it swings. Um, it's chamberish, it's funky, uh, and it's free. And with all of that in play, uh, you'd think it'd be kind of a mess, but it, oh, I'm telling you, it is, it is remarkably cohesive and, and very mature. Um, and that's really all brought about by the, the stunning interplay between these folks. Um, yeah, so let me step back for a second so you can, uh, sample a little bit of Sam Rivers and uh, Contrast from You know, I am a big Sam Rivers fan. I have been for years and I always will be. This is one of his better releases. It's a, it's a very adventurous listen and it is full of twists and turns, but ultimately it is very, very fulfilling. Contrast from Sam Rivers on ECM from 1980. Well, speaking of adventurous and twists and turns, uh, how about a little Hermeto Pasquale? <laughs> yeah, this is a brilliant 1988 Capital Intuition release. And I never can remember the title of it. I just refer to it as the painting album. Uh, the actual title itself is uh, Only If You Don't Want It, You Can't Do It. So, yeah, that little tongue twister doesn't work with my uh, old brain anymore. But as I said, this is a wonderful uh, release from the insanely prolific composer and multi-instrumentalist Irmeto Pasquale that uh, Miles Davis once said he wanted to come back as. Yeah. I mean, he's a Brazilian by birth, but uh, his music extends way, way, way beyond his native roots. I mean, uh, he gets into incredibly complex and layered music that yet is beautifully melodic. I mean, it is really beyond categorization. Um, Pasquale just, he, he paints with many, many, many colors on his palette. Um, you know, some people 
have referred to him as the Frank Zappa of Brazil. And, you know, at times that's not far off the mark, but I think he's got um, more depth uh, than Frank Zappa, as much depth as he had. Um, yeah, it, it's so hard to, uh, to conjure up the words uh, for this music. So, yeah, I think I'm just going to shut up and uh, get out of the way so uh, you can sample a little bit of, of this album. Um, yeah, it's really the best way. I'll tell you, your Meto Pasquale can really cook up some mean and dense musical stews. And, and the two ingredients that just really stand out to me are passion and joy. Truly delicious stuff. It's uh, your Meto Pasquale, the painting album. Because I, uh, please don't ask me to <laughs> remember that name. It's from 1988 on Capital Intuition. You know, it's always rewarding to dip back into McCoy Tyner's incredible run of milestone releases from the 1970s. This is a 1974 release called Samalayuka, so it's a, a middle period uh, release in this run, uh, in and amongst other awesome studio and live recordings. I mean, it's virtually impossible to single one of these albums out to stand out amongst the rest. I really view the entire run as a, a suite um, that is a variation on a theme. Oftentimes, the variations come from uh, the instrumental combinations uh, within a given album. And this is no exception. This is uh, a wonderful group, uh, <laughs> a slightly larger group. Uh, of course, McCoy Tyner on piano. How about the addition of Bobby Hutcherson on uh, Vibes and Marimba? John Stubblefield on oboe and flute. An incredible uh, sax uh, duo of Gary Bartz on alto and uh, Azar Lawrence on tenor. And uh, just a stud, stud uh, rhythm section. Buster Williams on bass, Billy Hart on drums, and Antume and Guillermo Franco on percussion. So it's, it is something, and these guys are clearly up to the task of uh, meeting uh, McCoy Tyner's, you know, intensity goals that he often sets for these uh, studio recordings and live performances. Just, just amazing. Compositionally, it's his, uh, it's his usual blend of uh, a very um, hypnotic uh, and inviting uh, modal melodies that are uh, bolstered by rhythmic power, uh, very dynamic interplay, very emotional solos. Um, it's just really a spectacle, time in and time out. Uh, there's also very cool uh, world references at play here, too, uh, where you've got... Uh, a nod to uh, African music, Latin music, Middle Eastern music. So it makes it um, a very, uh, very wonderfully weighty. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's pretty apt. Um, yeah, so let me step back so you can get a little sample of this wonderful uh, milestone run. And in this instance, uh, a little piece of Samalayuka.
What can I say? McCoy Tyner is always good for pressing my spiritual reset button, which I need to do uh, from time to time, I can tell you. Yep, 1974 milestone release, Samalayuka from the great, great McCoy Tyner. Well, next up is a very cool release from Nonesuch Records from 1976. Uh, it features the 12 etudes for piano, uh, books one and two from uh, Claude Debussy, as performed by the great pianist Paul Jacobs. Uh, this is a, a great sounding album as well, as it was uh, mastered by the legendary Bob Ludwig, so you can count on that for sure. But the, uh, the French composer, Claude Debussy, is arguably uh, the father of avant-garde music. And during the summer of 1915, and more towards the end of his life, uh, and over an astounding six-week period, he composed these 12 etudes, uh, or studies, uh, for piano. Uh, each one of these etudes uh, focuses on a, a singular aspect of piano playing. And so he takes these uh, pianistic issues or uh, problems and uh, uses them as a jumping off point uh, for these compositions. Uh, but these, uh, the, these, these problems uh, that he's uh, creating, sorting through and creating, uh, he applies his uh, impressionistic magic dust to them and they just sound wonderful they sound amazingly fresh uh, for being uh, a little over a hundred years old now incredible uh, i'm not a piano player uh, but i have asked um, some piano player friends of mine about this work and uh, they will uh, tell you to a person that it is uh, incredibly challenging to play, um, nearly uh, impossible to play. It's that difficult, that that challenging. And uh, Paul Jacobs or any piano player that you can find uh, who takes up and tackles this work uh, to be pretty damn masterful. So let me step back so you can hear one of uh, a bit of uh, Claude Debussy's 12 Etudes for Piano. really uh, evocative and stimulating at the same time. I really dig it. Claude Debussy's 12 etudes for piano. Um, you know, they're like, they're like 12 beautifully individually wrapped candies for your brain. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. From 1976 on Nonesuch Records and featuring the great pianist Paul Jacobs. All right, so I mentioned a field trip, so it is time. Um, yeah, I want to uh, step out of the uh, record room for just a couple minutes and uh, show you something uh, pretty significant that is right here in Kansas City, Missouri. Not Kansas, Missouri. So uh, let's hit it. I'll see you over there. Just follow me.
We're here at the final resting place of one of the greatest musicians in the history of mankind, Charlie Parker. We're at Lincoln Cemetery at the eastern edge of Kansas City, uh, almost to the Independence, Missouri line. And Charlie is here alongside his mother, Addie. And I like to come here to pay my respects to an artist whose face is on my Mount Rushmore of jazz, along with Louis Armstrong, Duke Ellington, Miles Davis, and John Coltrane. And as you can see, he died at the age of 34. And he was such a creative comet that I mean, he burned so bright, white, hot for the brief time that he was here. And I just, I like coming here to honor all of the tremendous music Charlie offered the world and for the tremendous influence that he had on jazz moving forward. Very cool. So let's head back to the record room for the last album of this vinyl orgy. And I think you just might have an idea of who that could be. <laughs> yeah, well, looky there. Yeah, I, uh... I want to talk about Charlie Parker and, in particular, uh, his recordings and time at the Royal Roost in New York City uh, during the uh, fall of 1948 and into the early parts of 1949. Um, you know, we as music collectors, record collectors who are on a, a constant and endless journey and search for new music, new sounds, new knowledge, connecting the dots, you know how it goes. I think it's really important to uh, occasionally take a long step backwards and touch base with artists and albums that are, you know, foundational and, and touchstones for whatever genre or genres that you're into. Uh, I find it to be uh, incredibly refreshing and it really resets things, you know, just to keep going. And uh, I find it to be just a very, very cool exercise. But Charlie Parker and his time at the Royal Roost are just so significant uh, to me. Uh, as this uh, essentially is the moment where jazz uh, turns from uh, the popular music of the day uh, into an art music. Um, you've got uh, a collision of events that kind of lead here, which I'll just briefly touch on. But, um, you know, before uh, World War II, uh, big band music, swing music, it was the popular music of the day. And um, people like Benny Goodman, they were pop stars, just no doubt. But World War II uh, had a huge impact. It, you know, thinned out the big bands. Big bands shrunk down to small bands. And uh, in 1942, uh, you had uh, a recording ban that went into effect where uh, the head of the musicians' union uh, said that uh, if you're a member of the musicians' union, you're not allowed to record uh, specifically uh, for any major labels, uh, there were a few, you know, small independent labels and people using fake names uh, that recorded stuff got out a little bit. But by and large, for a little bit over two years, there were no new recordings. And during this time, bebop was developing. It was in its infancy. And so we're missing uh, some very key moments in history of, of that development. But after World War II, and people are just trying to, you know, get their feet back on the ground, reestablish, um, uh, bebop was beginning to be recorded in earnest. 
Um, it wasn't uh, an immediate hit. Uh, musicians were, um, you know, uh, gigs were spotty, let's put it that way. And it, it took some time. And uh, uh, around uh, 1948 in the fall, uh, there was a very enterprising DJ named Symphony Sid Torin who uh, had a brilliant idea to uh, try to promote this modern new music of bebop on the radio. And then uh, he, he talked a booker and a, a club called the Royal Roost to uh, try bringing this music in. They did it once a week. It got popular. Uh, they, they turned it into a full-time uh, bebop venue. And it was here that, that it really changed, really became popular. People like Charlie Parker became the stars of the day. And uh, as you can see here uh, in this photograph, uh, taken at the Royal Roost with Charlie Parker, uh, the significant thing here is there's no dance floor. So it is. It has transformed into an art music. Uh, so it's very cool, very significant. Um, so now we have our second interesting player um, named Boris Rose. Now, Boris Rose was a, um, a jazz aficionado, and he had recording equipment. And part of Symphony Sid's grand idea was to do live broadcasts at the Royal Roost on Friday nights or basically Saturday morning uh, between 3 a.m. and 4 a.m. every every Friday Saturday night and uh, and Boris Rose recorded this stuff and thank God he did you know a bootleg or whatever he recorded this stuff and uh, it's just awesome that he did. He released some of this stuff out on his own labels, which are uh, incredibly rare. I'd love to get my hands on some of this stuff. But they've also come out through uh, major labels or major distributors. Uh, as I said, 1977 on Savoy. Savoy never recorded this. They just you know, used uh, Boris Rose's uh, materials. So there are lots of variations, different labels. Uh, you, to find uh, this Royal Roost material. Uh, what's significant also is it is Charlie Parker's working quintet, and he set the standard for a jazz group at this point of a quintet of, uh, of sax, trumpet, piano, bass, and drums. Uh, starting in the fall of 48, Miles Davis was in his group. Uh, very cool. Uh, Davis left and he was replaced by Kenny Dorham, which uh, is featured on this album. Now, I prefer personally Kenny Dorham uh, with Charlie Parker. He was more technically adept. Uh, he could stand up to the uh, to uh, spitting out the notes and the and the uh, the technical proficiency that was required of bebop uh, more than Miles could. Miles had feeling, no doubt, uh, but but uh, Kenny Dorham could keep up. Also, here you've got Al Haig on piano. Uh, Tommy Potter on bass and Max Roach on drums and uh, so this again is this this brilliant uh, turning point uh, in the history of jazz of turning it from a uh, popular music to an art music and uh, I just I love hearing this stuff yeah it's recorded off the radio it's not the greatest fidelity it doesn't matter it does not matter because they're playing their asses off Oftentimes they played the hits, and so yeah, this has, you know, Scrapple from the Apple, Groove and High, Confirmation, Salt, Peanuts, Night in Tunisia, yeah, just uh, standards, but, you know, handled with, uh, you know, impeccable improvisers, they're all new every time, and Charlie Parker is just, I, I, I still... I mean, I just uh, pretty much gasp sometimes at some of his solos. They just are... <laughs> uh, yeah, anyway, let me shut up. <laughs> Why don't you hear a little bit of this brilliance, this utter, utter artistic brilliance. So, yeah, Charlie Parker, uh, live from the Royal Roost uh, from 1949. <laughs> 
Imagine for one second actually being there and witnessing this. I mean, it translates just fine through all these years and 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 lesser equipment. But oh my God! I, I mean, can you imagine witnessing this in person? Wow! Wow! Who? <laughs> all those people were some lucky sons of bitches. That's all I can tell you. Wow. Anyway. I love this stuff. I love Charlie Parker. Bird at the Roost. It's a 1977 release on Savoy. And there are lots of other options for uh, material from the Royal Roost if you're curious about seeking that out. Well, thanks for hanging in there. Thanks for uh, joining me on the field trip and just generally uh, gotten it out. Um, I really appreciate it. Really appreciate all the subscribers, old, new, medium. Thank you. And more than anything, it's about the comments for me. Interacting with you all, uh, just, you know, if it's just saying hi or if it wants to go deeper and talk about uh, records or artists that uh, you're into, I'll go, I'll go deep. So, Hang in there, do what you can, keep it in the groove, and I'll see you next time.